Now, I was uh, on my way to my first assignment in 1962 in Glasgow, Montana. I was in the United States Air Force. And uh, Eastern Airlines was on strike, so I took a bus. And we stopped in Chicago. It was in November. It was a snowstorm, and Muddy Waters came in. And uh, he introduced himself to me as McKinley Morganfield. And uh, I knew who he was because I had a Muddy Waters record about him with the Stones or uh, or be before the Stones. He might have been playing with them then. He did a lot of European tours. And uh, I played some for him. I had my guitar, my silver tone amp. I had a K guitar. And he told me I had a lot of soul for a white boy. And when he went to leave, he said, keep your mojo working. And that's where the nickname came from. When I got to my assignment, I put together a band. I think it was the lead singer from the Kingsman. I can't remember his name. But uh, he said we ought to, something was happening down in San Francisco, this was late 66, early 67, and he said we ought to go down there and check it out. So we sent our, our roadies down there, two of them, for a weekend, and they came back three weeks later with everything you could ever want <laughs> as far as <laughs> psychedelics and marijuana, and I never tried anything. So we, uh, we decided we'd move down to the Bay Area. After living in Oakland for a while, we did a, a move to Berkeley, California. And that's where I met Country Joe, Country Joe and the Fish, McDonald. And he had us open up for them in the park in Berkeley one day for on a Sunday because Initial Shock had 10,000 watts of Macintosh PA with JBL speakers and We'd put it all together ourselves. Our PA actually outside was louder than the Fillmore or the Avalons. And so we got a lot of shows, opening shows, because people wanted to use our stuff. And they'd pay us a hundred bucks and, you know, that, that's how I kind of got the shows. We couldn't make any money in San Francisco, so we would tour out. So we went back in 67 and, or 68 and did a show with the Association cherish is the word of that that band and their road manager said if you if you want me to i know some people in san francisco in the real estate business and he found us in an apartment at a place called the casa madrona on masonic street right around the corner from the grateful dead ashbury masonic and then hate right here they lived halfway up the hill on the left and uh, i started writing and we, we would do about six or eight originals in that band. <clears throat> and uh, our first show at the Fillmore, we, uh, we were asked by Bill Graham to do a demo for him. And we did a recording at a place called Coast Recorders in 19, early 67. And when we presented him the 45, it was called The Mind Disaster, M-I-N-D. My first, one of my first songs, second song actually. He liked the song and he put us on in front of Country Joe and the airplane at the Fillmore. And after that, he liked us. He took a liking to the band, built it, and we would get a lot of openings because he liked us and we'd play cheap. <laughs> he later became my manager. I was on the street for about six months, panhandling pretty much. I actually met Jimi Hendrix in the, in the panhandle part of San Francisco doing a free concert on a Sunday afternoon. And the very next week he played Monterey. Initial Shock broke up in 1969, early 70. Uh, I met this guy named Ronnie Montrose in an apartment in the Mission District of San Francisco. He's living there with his wife and a kid, Jesse who was two years old. And uh, I heard him playing through a little Princeton amp out uh, on a window on the second floor. And I was looking to, for guitar players to form another band. 
And I went up and knocked on his door, and I said, Ronnie, uh, well, I said, man, I really like your playing. Would you like to jam with my band sometime? So that's how we got together. Sitting in the living room one night wondering what we should call the band. This is before we recorded our album. It's uh, signed with uh, Fillmore Records. And we were watching a John Wayne movie. And John Wayne walked in and said, give me a bottle. He said, how much? He said, a sawbuck. So we all went, looked at each other and went, hey, that's pretty cool. <laughs> sawbuck sounds cool. Let's call it the sawbuck, man. <laughs> moved to the Outer Banks, I didn't play for a, quite a while. I, I was pretty much writing stuff. And uh, it wasn't rock music. It was more folk-oriented ballads. She heard me playing one night at this little place. She came up and asked me if I could write a song to help her in this project. She had started the People to Preserve Jockey's Ridge, a nonprofit foundation come to find out she had laid down in front of a bulldozer to stop him from mowing down this area where the wind swept through and fed the dunes in this fetal area that would come off the sound and blow the sand up there. Well, they wanted to build condos in that area. And after a period of, say, 20 or 30 years, the dunes would have dissipated because it was 180 feet high when I moved there in 73. And so I wrote the song Shining Star with Jockey's Ridge for her. Well, that song was put on Diamond Shows between 74 and 79. I, I wrote a lot of different music and uh, we decided to make a record in 79 called Diamond Shows Tales Untold. And uh, I recorded it in Mega Studios in Bailey, North Carolina on a reel to reel 16 track with a guy named Richard Royal. There was a guy named Rob Beatty who had uh, started the thing called uh, Save Our SOS, Save Our Shores. <coughs> and uh, he, he came to me and asked me to write a song for him because he had heard that the lighthouse was being washed into the ocean. Well, I was playing down there one night and I came through and I heard some fishermen talking the next day at breakfast about how it was only 65 feet from the ocean and another storm might take it. So I went home and, and wrote the House of Light for his organization, which was a Virginia-based organization. I sang the song for 20 years to, and, and <clears throat> pretty much did it more or less just to raise awareness level. At least it kind of got them going. And uh, it's still, still raising money. Uh, and I, I was able to play at the Move uh, with a the inauguration of the move of the lighthouse for about 300 descendants of the light keepers. Just where I stand, I stood up for you, and I'm standing still. Save many lives, and I'll save on you. I was living in uh, Monroe, Louisiana at this time, it was 85 or 86. And uh, I met this guy from Garner that we had known, Bonnie and I, named Philip Weindog Cobb. He was a wild man, but he uh, had the job of driving all the stars from the trailer to the stage in a little golf cart. So he knew everybody. So uh, when he found out that I wanted to get on the Jazz Fest, he put in a word for me. So I got to open up for Kenny Neal, Stevie Ray Vaughan, and uh, Rayford Neal, his dad, uh, there was a group called Radiators that was the headline act. They were outside. Buddy used to come to Outer Banks, Buddy Pelletier, three-time world longboard champion, and uh, surf there because the waves were better, usually. And I got to know him from that, met him on the beach. <clears throat> and then when Scooter got to be a teenager, when Buddy would come down, he would give Scooter tips on how to surf. 
Buddy got sick. If she called me one night and said, you might want to come over, Buddy's not going to make it, I don't think, another night. He, uh, he had some kind of cancer in his in this area of his body. He wouldn't take any treatment. I uh, I got inspired sitting there watching him in the in his deathbed to write that song, and I wrote it that night and brought it the next day and played it for Lisa, and she loved it. Said, "Let's make a record of it," and we did a little uh, the video of it through my friend Les Frank, who used to work with the studio. Uh, he helped me film it, and we put it out and it made I think. 200 to 500 copies that were sold to raise money for the foundation, Buddy Pelletier Foundation. They give out a scholarship uh, every year to academically high students uh, in the surfing community. I submitted to for the fellowship about a year before I was notified and I had completely forgot about it and uh, it was an $8,000 fellowship to develop some kind of project that would help promote North Carolina when they called me and said you got this fellowship and I was at such a loss for words I broke down and cried because I hadn't heard from them in a year, I figured they'd pass me up. And uh, that's how I got the fellowship. And what it did was it opened my <coughs> opportunities to go into North Carolina schools and teach kids about folk music and the history of preservation, the lost colony, and I had a program on the Wright Brothers First Flight. So I had four programs that I would take into schools. and. Uh, share my music with slides. actually did a slide guitar festival in Wilmington uh, one year instead of having it in Brevard. There were a lot of good slide guitarists, none really well known. It was a great opportunity to meet other people that made handmade instruments and like uh, diddly bows and that kind of thing and played cigar box guitars and kind of opened my mind to a lot of different things uh, just besides a six string. So I started making uh, diddly bows myself. I think you had one of them on one of your shows. And I still have that one. Another learning experience, got to play at the B.B. King's Club, and I believe that might have been the year. It was so interesting. Uh, we didn't win or anything. It was just another learning experience to meet a bunch of different kind of bands that were similar to us, you know, and I hope to get signed and well known and all that. It never happened, but I went through the... Uh, Blue Society of the Little Cape Fear, Land Nichols, kind of got me in there. Uh, I won the contest down at the Rusty Nail Blues Saloon. 
uh, to go to Memphis and represent. But I, I didn't win, but uh, it was a great learning experience for me. I had to tell the story, though. Tell me where are you tonight? Out in the blue ocean, surfing God's holy light. I was coming off a, uh, a neck operation from Duke, uh, and uh, I spent a lot of time in Wilmington from 1996 to 2008. I was here 16 years, and uh, I, I was pretty much discovered by this guy named Harper Peterson, who's a senator. And he had a, a, a venue called Water Street Restaurant downtown on Water Street. And he saw me playing one day uh, on the, out in front of his place and asked me if I'd like to play during lunch at his place across the street. So I started out there uh, playing for him during lunch and he booked me for 16 years once a month. I think I influenced a lot of people there in Wilmington in the musical community they a lot of them would come in and see me when I play. Oh. And maybe they were the ones that voted for me. a guy named Hat Willard that had that art gallery and uh, I went to him one day and he, he wanted to be my manager. He booked me on a couple of Zoya festivals and, and uh, I told him, well let's do a show in there and we'll video it. So we, uh, he sold tickets and we sold that thing out and did it and it's still being shown on YouTube to this day. And it was done coincidentally by the sound was done by Mike Nash from Hound Sound Studios down in Supply where I'm staying right now. But the little devil sets him off and down Right back in the spot me and my baby So six strings like it's all We ain't got much money Sure don't plan on being no Hollywood movie star I saw this ad in a guitar player magazine for this guy named Dennis Zager who was making his own guitars and I found out that he was a part of a duo that had a song called In the Year 2525 which was a big hit years ago. And uh, from that, he started his own uh, American guitar making company, Zager Guitars. And he and his son, Dennis, worked together. And I sent him a letter and asked him if they might want to sponsor a, a, an American blues artist. And uh, they said, yes, we will. And they sent me a nice Zager guitar. And it's the one I featured on the Joyful Ride album. That's what I'm talking about. a blues, my mama wore no shoes, my life has been that long, lonely road half a century ago my papa was playing more my mama was carrying a loving easy soul born in two hard times and the road is not easy, a 
the blues have always been by my side Born into the blues and my life is fast and breezy If you live the blues is such a special pride And the blues has always been a joyful Nine years we've been together. Nine seasons. We're tired as a tick. They don't sing, but they, they're like Stevie Ray Vaughan in Double Trouble. They're right there for you. May 28th, 2018, I was playing at an outside venue in Duck called the Tap Shack, and it was six to nine gig. Went home, laid down on the floor, took a shower, and laid down on the floor in the living room, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't stop it. I just could, it just wouldn't stop the hurt, the pain. So I uh, told my wife, I said, "Man, I think I might." Go, should get checked out. We went to emergency room. They, they flew me, uh, took me in an ambulance to Norfolk, to a hospital there, and uh, put a couple stents in me through my arm, my wrist. It took me nine months to come back. It really hit me hard, and I couldn't play for nine months. And it was the kind of thing where every day when I get up, I'd want to play. But I'd also have this little thing go off in my brain that would say, don't try to do it too hard, man. You might have another heart attack. Because once you have one, I guess, you know, my dad died from heart, heart problems. And it kind of runs in the family. My dad, William Collins Sr., he uh, probably one of the best guitar players to come out of North Carolina. He helped pioneer country music in the Triangle area back in the 40s and 50s and the 60s, 70s, and he died in 81. It, it's been a slow process to come back, but I think I've changed my diet. My wife takes really good care of me. She cooks uh, low-fat food for me, and I quit smoking, and it's, it, was a, uh, it was a life changer for me. It was life or death. The deacons at, the ch at my church had, <coughs> he, was, uh, he was in the uh, Marine Corps, still active. He, uh, uh, unbeknownst to me, he submitted me to receive that. And uh, they tried to get me out to the church for three months, and I wouldn't go, mostly because of the heart attack thing, and I just didn't want to be around people. They finally got me there and they presented it to me, so it was a total shock to me. I cried and it, uh, was, a, it, it was something that most people don't get in their lifetime. I started painting on uh, old wood that I'd find, dumpsters along the road, barn wood and that kind of thing. I used the grain of the wood, sand it, and then use acrylic paints with it to and then I, I started framing it with a sand fence that you'd find on the beach. The, the sand fence that they put up to, for erosion. It, it's a hobby that got out of hand. 
my stuff started selling a few years ago and uh, it's uh, continuing now and I'm really, really blessed and humbled by it. I went in and some little uh, a Taco Bell on the strip going through Jacksonville. And as soon as I came in the door, this little girl looked at me and said, Sam! She thought I was Sam Elliott. Actually, she would not believe I wasn't Sam Elliott. And she made me sign a napkin saying, Sam. 